think these were places of teaching. I think these were what are called memory spaces. This is like a, the nature of pre-literate societies. They were trying to develop language. You go into like these enclosures, like you've got a reconstruction of enclosure DS. Yeah, the Channel Earth Museum, which is incredible. And you go in there and you think, you realize these are important sacred spaces. This is like a, this is like a kind of cathedral. Is that like massive? They're like 18 foot tall pillars. It's like unbelievable. And it just seems like you could just go around to each section where people sit and around the benches telling stories and information from one pillar, which is encoded so only maybe the elites would understand it on some levels. But then they would then be able to go and teach the initiates to come in and we'll look at this. And maybe that time of year, this one gets lit up by the sunrise. So we'll talk about this. And it's all designed in this astronomical configuration in my opinion um so it, all sorts of possibilities and i think all of them are valid i think they're all as valid as one another and we shouldn't just accept what's on wikipedia my name's hugh newman uh, I'm a researcher, a writer, an explorer based in um, England near Stonehenge. And my main focus currently has been for a few years, in fact, is the sites in southeast Turkey, Karahan Tepe, Gebekli Tepe, Seybirch, and a whole bunch of other sites and discoveries that are coming out of there. To me, are going to completely rewrite history. And I call it a super civilization, the world's first one. I mean, because this is just the innovations, the astronomy, the geometry and everything else is astonishing. And having an understanding of what has been discovered in stone circles and pyramids and the intricacies of all of these, to find the stuff in Southeast Turkey so much older and just as sophisticated is incredibly important to kind of get your head around. Yeah, it's crazy the stuff that that we're finding out there. And I mean, you're talking about us. You're talking about sites uh, that are thousands of years older than the oldest known megalithic sites that exist around the world. And the technology that we're finding, the things that 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 they were able to accomplish there is just incredible. So I can't wait to get into that and really uh, let the audience know about some of that stuff that we're finding. Some of the more recent. Uh, revelations that have come out are incredible and and a lot to do with 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 your work specifically um you know i mentioned the um the face that gets lit up on the the winter solstice um you, you know you've talked about uh, the geometry involved the astronomy involved the metrology so really looking forward to to um to diving into this with you what's a good place for us to kick it off I think we should, uh, I mean, basically everywhere in that area is fascinating, but Karahan Tepe is the one we've been looking at closely uh, because this is only recently being excavated. It's only since 2000, late 2019 it really began, and COVID hit, and, and since then the discoveries are coming out of them. I and mean, I've been visiting this site since 2014, before it was excavated, you know, and, and this is, if people aren't aware, this is an area about 23 miles uh, southeast of the Beckley Tepe Chandler area. It's in the mountains, uh, an area called the Tech Tech Mountains. So it's a really vast, desolate limestone area. It's like going to Mars or something. It's, it's crazy. There's a few farms in there, very, very little vegetation. And we got to know the owners of the farm that Karahan Tepe is on. And, you know, since 2014, I mean, my friend Andrew Collins, he's, he's written about it as well. He's been going there since 2004. And the, you have all these T-pillars, the tops of them, like, sticking out of the ground all over this hill, this huge hill. It's bigger than Gebekli Tepe, in fact. And and people have always wondered what was going to be found there. We never thought it was ever going to get excavated until it, it suddenly started being excavated. So, so this is now what has come out is absolutely astonishing. I mean... And then virtually the first time we went there since it was excavated, myself and my partner JJ Ainsworth discovered this winter solstice phenomenon where the light comes through this thin hole, this porthole stone, and illuminates this giant stone head which is carved out of the bedrock in what's called structure AB or the pillar shrine. And so we we found this amazing winter solstice alignment there as well. So it kind of triggered us into like thinking, hang on a sec, if, if they're able to do that, then these are very sophisticated people. They were, or they were just experimenting and got lucky or something because you shouldn't be able to, you know, you must have a vast amount of knowledge leading up to that to be able to 
build that into the bedrock and the stone carve it out and have it there as a kind of almost like a clock beginning the year. But I think Karahad Tepe is, is really important because Gobekli Tepe has been, you know, quite a lot of it's been excavated, but even so, that's only, only 5% of Gobekli Tepe is excavated. It's Karahad Tepe, they're going for it. They're, they're, they're just pushing it. They're, they're like pushing to get the whole site excavated. And, and they're like, they're, I think more of it's been excavated now than Gobekli Tepe. It's only been going for a few years. Was Gobekli Tepe has been excavated since nineteen what the mid nineteen nineties? So, yeah. So and there's, then there's a whole bunch of other sites as well, not just these ones. Yeah, how many are there? What, what's the? I know there's some debate about that. Yeah, there's officially there's twelve. It's called the Test Tepela, and this is, means stone hills or stony hills. Really, it's more of a sort. It's not just stone hills. It's more of a kind of like the sacred stone hills. Really, that's the kind of vibe that the name gives out it's not just random stone hills um and that's that's kind of what that means so officially there's 12 yeah but then we were talking with one of the uh experts over there uh, recently in may and they said no there's definitely now 38 of these sites um, but even so one of the archaeologists and some other researchers before that predicted you know based upon discoveries and just that there could be up to 100 of these as well and this is an area about 125 miles wide in southeast turkey and then you've got sites going into the levant you've got like going down into syria israel even is even pre pottery neolithic sites which is this era uh, about 11,600 years ago i mean onwards going back even into egypt and all the way up into armenia as well and even on uh, cyprus they found finding stuff as well now and so we're, i'm realizing that this is something you know more spectacular than people realize and especially compelling considering these are what six thousand years uh before you know the sumerians you know seven thousand years before Stonehenge. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's quite it's quite amazing when you kind of consider that. I mean, the, the, these were ancient. These had disappeared, forgotten about, built over, covered over deliberately at the end of their use, um, and then just forgotten about. Do you know how much LIDAR has been really used across this general area to really kind of get a, a, a really a full picture of how big this could be? Not yet. No. I, I, LIDAR, they've done GPR. I know that. Um, especially at Gebekli Tepe, and they, and they know there's about 20 enclosures there at least. Only five have really been excavated, or six maybe. And no, they don't really do LIDAR, I don't think. I don't know if it would work there or not, because they're buried in stone and rubble okay. the stone site, and they're stone sites, so I don't know how well it would work there. But there's a lot of sites that have been talked about, uh, surface finds, T-pillars sticking up out of the ground, um, but I would like to check, you know, it'd be really interesting to check all that. Um, I mean, I know that you can actually, I think most of the, you know, a lot of the planets been LIDAR'd as such. It's just a case of getting the data and analyzing it because I'm sure there's stuff like it's sort of hidden just, just under the surface that still, that, that might, that might come up. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then the age of the sites, I mean, we talked about like 11,500 years Ish. Can you talk about how we know the the age of the site, this material within the stone walls that were not the T pillars themselves, of course, because you can't you can't date stone, but but the material that's in between the stone walls that that are kind of within uh, many of the enclosures have been dated to that approximate eleven thousand five hundred ish date range. Is that correct? Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, but, but what they found is uh, at Gebekli Tepe, this is where they're done. This is like a German archaeological institute. These are like high level scientists. It was originally run by Klaus Schmidt. It's very efficient, very focused archaeologist who I've got a huge amount of respect for. He died, unfortunately, in 2014. Um, and I met him a couple of times, thankfully. And the dating they were getting it is pretty tight. I mean, I mean, because basically what the, they were finding stuff in the walls, at the very bottom of the walls, mind you, where it touches the bedrock. So you've got to remember, this is all built up on bedrock. So they were getting down to the bedrock and taking stuff out from there. They weren't just taking it off the top of the walls or anything like that, which would be possibly later. So they were, I think it's pretty accurate. I think it makes sense 
the, the, the dating about 9,600 BC, 11,600 years ago. But they were, it was still a couple of hundred years either side of that. But you go before that and you've got the whole Younger Dryas you know, within a 200 year before that, 9,800 BC, it was still the horrific weather, freezing cold, all that kind of stuff. It only really started warming up around that time in that area. And But there are sites, strangely, which are older. You know, there's a place, a place called Chakmak Tepe, that's southwest of it. Now, there's no tea pillars there, but it's certainly a settlement area. And they were carving out the bedrock as well. Over This is all around the Euphrates River, these sites. There's a bunch of settlements over in that area which um, date to a thousand years before Gebekli Tepe, like uh, Bonchoklu Tala, Kortik Tepe, um, and you've got a couple of others, you know, which are pushing those dates in that area, uh, which we visited some of them as well. And so that suggests that there was, and, and, and these, these weren't T-pillar sites, but they had megaliths. They were well, sort of megaliths, small, you know, five-foot tall stones, enclosures, uh, some of them were roofed, we know that. Some had porthole stones, like you get at Gebekli Tepe. Kortik Tepe had these beautiful, uh, like, you know, hand-sized stones with 3D relief carvings on, mm -hmm. which is similar style, but although much bigger at Gebekli Tepe. But it shows you there could be an influence coming in from the Tigris settlements, Tigris River settlements. Um, and or they, they emerged because of the improvement of the weather, the cataclysm was all over, they all started coming together. And so, yeah, it's difficult to know. We, we're, we're trying to piece this together for our, our next book um, about, you know, how this could have all happened and why it happened. But you've got to remember that there were the Natufians who were around before this as well, mainly in the Levant, but also going into Turkey, modern-day Turkey. And they created beautiful stonework, beautiful, uh, you know, like stone pots, quite big ones, urns, different plates and things like this. Not quite the quality of Karahan Tepe plates uh, or what you find in Egypt much later. But we are, you know, there is there is certainly a, a development leading up to Gebekli Tepe. You know, a lot of people say it just came out of nowhere. And in a sense, it did because the innovation suddenly went ballistic at that time. But there, there, was, a, there was a build up. You could see a progression build up to that point um, as well if you look carefully and look at the data and look at the discoveries and look at the dating and um, but yeah when it comes to the actual dates they are pretty tight on the dates I think although Klaus Schmidt where before we died when I spoke to him um, he told me and Andrew when we, we met him briefly at, at the site back in like 2015 was, sorry 2014 before we, before we died and he said that he believes at Gebekli Tepe they're going to find dates going back 14,000 years. And whether he was just wildly speculating, we don't know, or, or if he was serious about this. But Natufians, we know, go back nearly that far as well. So there, there could be something going on there. We also have the dating of Karahan Tepe. There's all this controversy about the dating of Karahan Tepe. Being, they, officially, it's 9,400 BC, although on Wikipedia... And some articles that came out two years ago, they say it's older. I know Ben uh, Ben Van Kirkwick and the Snake Brothers contend because they're, they're basing what well, they from from that information that Kakaran is actually older. Now this could well be the case. Now this is like really interesting because they, when they were making their first discovery and things at the site, they were finding dates older than Gebekli Tepe. But then they realised that the actual construction what you find constructed at Karahan Tepe really is no older than 9,400 BC. So the site was being used before the time, before that time, for quite a period of time, maybe a thousand years, 500 years, as a kind of maybe a hunting area where they would meet up and do things. Maybe there were some natural bedrock features which would lop and they would like maybe they that's why they built the with a solstice alignment into it slowly and then they slowly started building the site from around 9400 bc onwards so that's what we think you know we think that there is actual dating that goes back before the time of gobekli tepe at Karahan tepe but officially it's 9400 bc whereas gobekli tepe is 9600 bc but who knows i mean the other problem is is that before Karahan Tepe got excavated, there was a big announcement and a big new kind of promotion of Gebekli Tepe being the zero point in time, the oldest site in the area and all this kind of stuff. 
And so they couldn't really have another site being older than it that was going to be just as well known. And so, so it could be it could be a political move as well. And so the, the, you've got to look at the, the, these kind of elements here. But I think um, the head archaeologist at Carahan Tepe is pretty solid. I don't think he's going to give false dates to, you know, I think he's going to be as accurate as he can. The Younger Dryas was a time period of about 1,200 years from 11,600-ish to 12,800-ish years ago where the climate was going through dramatic changes. There were sea level rise. There were temperature changes. There's evidence that, that a lot of the Earth's biomass was on fire. There were extinctions of megafauna from around the Earth. And so um, we know that that took place around the same time. So it seems like that, that these structures, a lot of these structures were built, or the dating that we're getting from a lot of these structures seems to be right after, right kind of when things kind of settled a little bit down. How much evidence is there that people were creating and building these massive structures during some of the most difficult climactic times in human history? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, look, like I say, the other sites in the Tigris area and the pre-Gobekli Tepe sites, they weren't so megalithic, really. They were kind of more... They were, weirdly, they were settlements, but these were hunter-gatherers settling and building and, like, still quite advanced, you know, knowledge of, like, working with stone. Um, they would make, you know, there's even early evidence of terrazzo flooring, uh, which is like this lime water, um, which is almost like geopolymer. And they were, they, they, they still were pretty smart people. They had an understanding. They were building structures for survival. They were started domesticating some animals in some places. But really the thick stuff, the big kind of structure, really didn't happen until really Gebekli Tepe time, Karahan Tepe time. That, that was when it, that era, so it was after the kind of horrific weather, if you like, that that started really happening. Before that, it feels a bit more survival-oriented um, rather than innovative, where that, when that really kicked off, um, I think, when people could relax a bit. You know, the climate had improved. There was abundant fauna and flora. Um, there was food available everywhere, which may have became a problem. That's why they started developing agriculture within a couple of hundred years of Gobekli Tepe being built, because uh, that was definitely afterwards, because for a long time it was thought that agriculture instigated the building of structures. But actually, now it's the other way around. The megalithic structures were being constructed to a very advanced level. Then agriculture developed from that as such. Or even possibly, some people say independently of that, it just happened to be at the same, roughly the same time. But I think there's certainly a connection, especially when you start looking into all the biblical legends and the whole Garden of Eden story and all that associated with it. But, you know, there's there's, there's a lot more to this than meets the eye, and there's still huge contradictions between different archaeologists, different researchers, and the data that's coming out, because the conclusions are trying to be made already by the archaeologists, and you can't really do that yet. There's, there's nothing, there's not enough data to really kind of prove things one way or the other. When you look at kind of what, what we're talking about now as it relates to Gobekli Tepe and these other sites, we're talking about cement. I mean, cement, I think we had thought was like a Roman invention, right? For, 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 uh, for a couple of thousand years now, we thought that the Romans were the first ones to come up with that. But, but now we're, we're talking about cement. We're talking about potentially um, alcohol, brewing, brewing beer. I know that there were um, poisonous snake heads found, which potentially could mean drug dotes and antidotes. And, and uh, you know, there could be different ceremonies happening. What was happening? I mean, I want to get into all of that. And I want to touch on the evidence for all of this. I want to touch on like the, the fact that they're making these stone plates out of some of the hardest stones on earth. We've got granite, we've got basalt, you know, you've got um, just some incredible, incredible things happening here. What do you think this place was like? What were the, what were they doing here? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot to unpack there. But so there's like, the, it's all about innovation to me. You know, I think the innovation is insane. I mean, you you, you 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 go back to that time. Imagine, you know, being a hunter gatherer, and suddenly, you think, well, actually, let's let's try and make some cement. You know, let's try and carve some beautiful stone plates from basalt. Um, 
let's create air conditioning under our houses at Navali Churi in 8300 BC, you know, things like this. You, you can't, to me, there must have been some trigger. And I think the climate was a big trigger. But I think it's, I think different groups came in together and decided to put their heads together. And I think there were some very genius level people there. I mean, I think with... We're talking, the memory of these are recorded as the watchers from the Book of Enoch or the Old Testament, even the Anunnaki from the Sumerians. I think we have to consider that because the level of sophistication that suddenly grew from this place, from this area, was outrageous. It's just, it just doesn't make sense. That doesn't include the astronomy and the geometry and the metrology of these, of these sites. Well, if we just look at a couple of, let's look at some examples you mentioned. All right, so we'll talk about the terrazzo floor flooring um and the plaster they were just basically you have to get you know you basically break up limestone you heat it up you have to get it to like something like 850 degrees which is hot you know it's like you have to have a proper super sized kiln to get it to that hot so you break up this this limestone and then you mix some of the powder with water and the small chunks of limestone which hot which toughens it up and then you lay it down dry and then they would add red ochre to this as well to give it a bit of a kind of color you know sometimes they would actually create lines of red ochre in it like you get in the Vali Churi and Chianu another site uh, which is north of Kiabakar and you know and so this was they weren't just they were carving out the bedrock they were leveling floors of these enclosures then they were kind of leaving curbs around the edge like little benches a few inches high which I believe that they were slotting the T-pillars into originally before they built any... The walls were later additions. This is, again, this is why the question of the dating comes up over and over again. But I think they were slotting into these, you know, slots in the bedrock they were carving out. But also, they were creating, like, the Navali Churi and, and a couple of enclosed at Gebekli Tepe, and we think at Karahan Tepe. They were creating these... They were laying down this terrazzo floor, and this is and then letting it dry, and it hardens as hard as modern cement. It's really good. It's very smart, very simple technology. But where did that even that idea even come from, to heat up a bunch of stone, you know, to, like, see what happens kind of thing? Um, and so then they realised, oh, actually, this is really good. And you can actually lodge T-pillars into the terrazzo floor, and they would, hold, they would stay upright. It's like, you know, cement, you know, compacting it in the base. And so... So that was developed back then, and that was used in abundance. I mean, we're talking hundreds of square feet of it at certain sites. And so, but why? Why not just carve the bedrock if they can do that? Why would they need to go to this level, this extreme level of creating this um, certain type of uh, product, this technology, which I'm sure they would sell the idea to other people across the, the region. And, yeah, so that's one, that's one innovation. Another one we can talk about is again we're at Navali Churi. Now this is a little bit later. This is this is pre-pottery Neolithic B era, 8300 BC onwards. This is one of the later sites. And this is when they became more settlements. <clears throat> and you have like lots of you know domestic buildings and you have a, a main enclosure. This time it's a square enclosure. And in that that's got terrazzo floor, but some of the buildings were huge. They were like 16 meters or what 40 feet long. Um, you know, like nine feet, ten feet high, and then you know, with roofs, they were like made of plaster, like terrazzo kind of plaster, you know, with wood and everything else, and, and you know, carving out beds and things like this. But underneath the main house, probably the kind of royal house of Navali Churi, they carved these chairs, and the water from the Kantara stream, which comes in from the Euphrates River, um, would actually they would actually have little sluice gates that would open them up. And, and allow the cold water to come in on hot days. And the cool water running through kind of cool the air. And so this is the first ever air conditioning invented anywhere on the planet, 8,300 BC. And so it's like, why isn't this a big deal? I mean, why aren't people, you know, everyone talking about this? To me, this is mind-blowing. I mean, I mean, they, you know, now we take it for granted, air conditioning, fans and everything else, but they were doing it with nature, working with the natural elements to get this. And to me, that's more innovative than inventions today because you haven't got any electricity, you haven't got anything, you know, you haven't got any tools, you don't have any already pre-designed things to kind of make that happen work whereas then they had nothing they had to do it all from scratch and so little things like that are just 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 mind-blowing um and then you realize that um as you mentioned they were brewing beer 
And they were brewing, basically, this is mainly from Bali. They, would, they brewed a beer from Bali. They found all these big bats at Gebekli Tepe and other and other sites. In fact, in fact, they found evidence at Kortik Tepe, which is older than Gebekli Tepe. This is near the Tigris, one of the sites there, of wine production. They found evidence of wine inside some of the um, enclosures or houses there. So that's really interesting. That's older than Gebekli but this beer production it's not really beer anyway it'd be like a gruel like a gruel disgusting gruel hoppy kind of thing you sort of chew on uh, to drink if they're going to produce it it's not going to be like a nice glass of ale you get down the pub um to be a little bit a little bit rougher probably not as tasty but problem with that is is that you do get an alcohol content but not very, very low alcohol content but if you leave it for a while you get ergot growing on it now this is a psychedelic fungus which Albert Hoffman synthesized LSD from. And so you have a little bit of accidental ergot in your system and you're going to be like tripping like you are where in the 1960s. You know, it's like, you know, absolutely powerful hallucinogenic. It can kill you as well, ergot. It's pretty powerful. There was a whole sort of spates of it in France in the medieval times, people getting sick from it and dying from it and tripping out from it, going mad from it and things like this. So I believe that they knew what, not necessarily knew what they were doing, but they accidentally discovered ergot. And we know that they were using that because even before that, that Rekachek cave, I think it's called in Israel, going back nearly 14,000 years ago, they were producing beer there as well, earlier than Gebekli Tepe. And this had ergot on it. And so, and they, they had this skull death cult associated with it. So they realized these people may have been tripping out big time. And so I think that may have been happening at Gebekli Tepe, especially when you see it as well, you see mushroom symbolism all over the place there. Uh, there's lots of evidence, lots of head shapes, which are like the shape of a kind of mushroom. And they definitely there was bovine activity there. There was cows and cattle, aurochs and everything else. And magic mushrooms of psilocybin would grow on the dung. So I think they were drinking, they were taking LSD, <laughs> and they were on mushroom. So I think this is where innovation may have actually come from. I mean, I'm quite serious about this, um, especially when you look at, they were they found evidence of mushrooms and cannabis at Chattel Hoyak, uh, which is a couple of thousand years after Gebekli Tepe, further west, um, which is a famous site before Gebekli Tepe got it discovered. And so there's something about that. It's the old, whole food of the gods, Terence McKenna idea. But I really believe, I mean, you look at some of the abstract design, you look at some of the bizarre ideas and the kind of artistic flair on the statues, on the tea pillars, and in the creation of these sites, and the geometry and like studying the stars. This is all very a psychedelic influence, in my opinion. And and it was hugely influential because I think you look at the 2000 year period, these sites were in operation. The same style was continued and duplicated. It wasn't changed. They came up with the first design everything stayed the same from that moment onwards and so what why why did that happen so what, what you know why it's almost like the first part of it was the perfect part and the rest just copied it from there on what would have caused could could climate change have caused all of the like a um like i guess you would see an influx of pop of human population into this area for some reason i guess right i mean like why why would people have all decided this was a very fertile uh place this was above the tigris and euphrates river this was this was like a this was a good place for humans to live and survive back uh, thousands of years ago is that is that why people swarmed here yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it's pretty. Yeah, I think they were following the rivers. I mean, all the all these, you got the two big rivers and all the streams uh, coming off them. Euphrates is the one, all the Gebekli Tepe and everything's kind of near ish, um, and you know all the tributaries. And then you got the Tigris, where all the other cultures are. It's only like a couple of hundred miles between them. Yeah. But th these are the two sort of sacred rivers of biblical tradition. Although usually it's much further south where they connect in Mesopotamia. Um, Iraq, Iran, all that kind of area. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, because for some reason, this just seemed to be where it was all happening. And I guarantee they were just moving along the rivers and they were probably just working out the, the best places to do things. But also, there may have been other reasons. I mean, there could be just this was known, you know, going back to Mesolithic, Paleolithic times as, as a sacred place. 
you know, it may have been seen as a sacred place. I mean, because Gebekli Tepe is, there's something about it. There's, there's something kind of strange and magical about it, even before it got discovered. People would go up there to this spot, which is no, and, and there were lots of burial, later medieval burials and Islamic burials would use that hill to bury their dead. They planted a mulberry tree there, which became known as the wish tree, uh, where people would go and make wishes. It was also a fert fertilizing kind of area where people would go up there in, in a sacred way and look for fertility to enhance their pregnancy and, and wish to the gods and the ancestors of that spot where this mulberry tree was, this wish tree, and leave ribbons on it and things like this, uh, not knowing that un right underneath them was part of Quebecli Tepe, you know, which is still partly buried right at that spot. In fact, it was right next to Enclosure D, where, the, where this was <laughs> weirdly all happening. And in Enclosure D, there's a major spiralling magnetic anomaly as well, which is being recorded in the natural geology there. So, so that could have been... You know, something about the magnet, there might be some mag, they might have noticed that and sensed that and, and seen that as sacred. Um, you know, because when you, when there's magnetic effects, it kind of affects your consciousness. And it's also related to fertility. You know, this is the work of John Burke, Philip Callahan, and others. And so you have to consider all these different things. And also, magnetic anomalies can create strange lights and, you know, balls of light, orbs even, you know, all around, you know, where, where they occur. And so there might have been luminosities in that area, which they got attracted to, and it became the sacred place, long before anything was built there. And so it could, could have had a, a sacred meaning before, you know, anything else. So that's why they decided to con construct, the, the I believe, the temples there, because there are settlements down by in Channel Erfa, which is like, what, 10 miles away? Uh, called Yemen Ahali, and this is where they found Earth and Man statue, you know, with the V neck and everything. There was a big settlement there, and the river would run through there, the streams would come through, there were springs there. It's a very rich, abundant, lush place. But up on the hill in the mountain there, you have Quebec Tepe, away from all the water, away from the civilization. Even though the modern archaeologists are trying to make it out that this Quebec Tepe was the domestic site. I believe the main domestic site would have been down in Chandlerfa, you know, and then they would go up there to do their kind of special events and things like that. Given that it's been hundreds of thousands of years that intelligent hominoids have been on this planet and we can't really date stone, I mean, is there any crazy theory or logic to support the idea that these could be way older i mean that 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 this bedrock could have been carved out or these t pillar pillars could have been placed fifty thousand years ago they're twenty thousand years ago you know i mean is there any what any, any thoughts there is there any any data to support yeah. any, any of that craziness um that is yeah that craziness is is compelling yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, one, uh one of the ways that my good friend colleague andrew collins but helps that and this is what klaus schmidt did as well was the arrowheads that are found at these sites, types of arrowheads. You can kind of date cultures based upon the, the tools and the, the arrowheads, the, the blades, the microblades, and all this kind of stuff. And so they haven't anything older than particularly 12,000 years at Gebekli Tepe with the arrowheads and the, and the microblade technologies. Although there is, um, so, that, so that, I mean, I think that is, it kind of helps date it better than you know in a way but you know it backs up the kind of carbon dating so i i personally don't think there's anything much older okay. but i think it could be a bit older you know because it, it it would make sense with the arrowhead it finds uh we know that there's sites very close like chakmak tepe which goes back 600 700 years older than gebekli tepe You've got the tigris river settlements as well obviously um but there's also this microblade technology comes in from the, the kind of Ural mountain, the Russian steppes, over a 30,000-year period. You know, they noticed a progression coming down, coming south from that area. They've also found what's called a Helwan point, um, which is a, something Klaus Schmidt wrote about, uh, Andrew's written about. And this is Helwan's in Egypt. So they found a type of arrowhead found this in, in Egypt, uh, a place called Helwan, which is not too far from Cairo, Saqqara area. And there's a whole there was a whole settlement there and there's actually, well, I believe some of the vases, the stone vases, are almost this kind of dating, as far as I'm aware. And I was talking to Ben about this, Ben Kirk, Ben Kirkwood, and and so there's a there's even connections going from that direction as well. But the microblade technologies from thirty thousand years ago coming down into that area do support 
the dates more or less that Klaus Schmidt and others have put forward. Um, but the fact that they're, they're definitely finding settle, you know, like the Carahan, so they're finding older arrowheads there and microblade technologies which have pushed the date back, but not of construction, just of settle, you know, people hanging out in that area. So it's a big question mark, to be honest with you. But you got right, number one as well, they've only unlocked a very small amount of Gobekli Tepe. They might have found older blades and microblades in the fill of a bit they haven't excavated yet. And so you've got that to consider as well. And so I think, you know, you might get what Klaus Schmidt predicted. You might get dates going back 14,000 years. That could well be the case. So you, you've you spent a ton of time over there, right? I mean, you go there several times a year. You're based out of out of, um, out of of England, um, but, but, but you're there. You're in Turkey visiting these sites multiple times a year. You take tours. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah. We take tours. Yeah, we do, we do tours. Um, I mean, our, our knowledge of the area is increasing constantly and, We've been doing tours for like 12, 13, 11 years or so, you know, on and off. Um, anyway, you know, we first went out there. In fact, we went out there the first time in 2013 with Graham Hancock as part of one of our guests. So that was very, very That's nice. Cool. It was his first time out there as well. So it was very nice to go out with him. Uh, but Andrew is, is really the main writer on this whole area. He's been writing about this area since 1996. So he's he's inspired me a lot to kind of start looking. You know, we, we come in, for, we have different you know perspectives, we have different you know uh, disciplines we've, we're focused on, so we don't, we don't clash with our research. But there's um, yeah, I mean, it's a really important place. I mean, this is like what's happening out there now. Now is the era of discovery. There, it's like yeah. going back a few hundred years into ancient Egypt or the Mayan jungles of Guatemala and Mexico. You know, when people are discovering pyramids and finding them, hacking through the... This is literally happening now. I mean, we've actually found stuff ourselves by just going to unexcavated sites, having a look around, getting to know the locals and the families, having always having permission, of course. In fact, we found, you know, a kind of a broken tea pillar at an unexcavated site that no one has ever recorded, just lying there in a field. We're like, what the hell? Mm-hmm. And it... We've been going back there a few years, and it's still there. We found it like two and a half years ago, and it's still just sitting there. Too and, heavy and so for anybody like to this. move. <laughs> yeah, it's just crazy. And so, and we've got photos of it. And, so, and there's also an underground tunnel we, we kind of located as well near one of these sites, which is like 100 meters long, carved out of the bedrock. No one knows who did that when it was done. It's very weird. Um, See, so, yeah, there's so much, and uh, and there's a site called Sayberch as well, which is really interesting. Uh, that's just started to be excavated. It's actually partly under someone's house. Um, there's even a whole underground area there. And we must remember there's um, like all the underground cities we find as well. There's evidence at Derinkuyu, way over in Cappadocia, near near Channel Hoyak in that area. That is actually much older. There's, they found Paleolithic and Mesolithic um, microblade technologies there. Yeah. And so, we, you know, we're finding, yeah, there's a lot going on. I mean, and yeah, and there's also like you get polygonal walls in Turkey. Now, these aren't as old. These are like Hittite and Hattian sites, which go back 5,000 to 3,000 years. Uh, you get polygonal walls like you get in Peru, you know, in, in Turkey, just all, you know, for certain areas. You get cart ruts there. You get other, you know, you get dolmens there. It's, it's crazy. I mean, but these these are very unknown kind of areas that we, we kind of we take we we tend to go to as well. To, to you know when we look around, go on tours and that for such things. Here we are, and we have all of these structures. Now, does that change? Can that go back and change and and maybe upset the apple cart a little bit, but force a rewrite to some of the history that we've written about some of these other ancient sites like Darren Kuyu, which is a complete mystery. Nobody knows how old that site is. Um, could 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 that potentially? You know, do you see a time in the future when um, history is is rewritten a bit, and 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 we see a little bit more alignment between some of the ancient structures around the world? Yeah, I mean, I think Derek Hughes is a, a good example. I mean, they uh, as, as a, a researcher, I forget his name, unfortunately, but um, where he uh, the first levels are the oldest, the first one or two levels, and they're quite well carved. They're all, they're none, none, there's no metal being used there. The other levels, there's metal being used to carve them. You can tell the difference in the striations. He found the areas where they dumped all the, the stone and dust by the river and found the microblade arrows and all this kind of stuff and found that these were Paleolithic, mainly early Mesolithic. So we're talking about the era around early you know early time of Quebecli Tepe and so the, and, that, and he documented it published it, and that was it 
and yeah, but that's completely ignored now if you go to the site now. Um, and so you've got that kind of thing. But also, like my local site, Stonehenge, you know, I, I live just, just nearby. And that has got evidence going back 10,000 years, 8,000 BC, of these giant post holes made of pine wood, which were found there. Um, and these were like three feet wide, possibly 30 feet or so tall, aligned roughly east-west. Um, and there's also a site called Blick Mead, which is a, a flint napping site just down the road from me. And that goes back to the same era. That's also a natural spring area as well. And so they were marking the location of Stonehenge 10,000 years ago. This is like the era just after, towards the end of Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe. And so I firmly believe that these all connected because what i've found as well uh which is very strange is i found the same kind of geometries at gebekli tepe in in just the enclosures that have been excavated and at karahan tepe as we find in the british stone circles and not maybe stonehenge specifically but other stone circles in britain and um and I, that to me that is utterly compelling i mean it's so obvious when you look you find the same, this is all based upon the, the geometries of Alexander Tom, um, who was a Scottish engineer who surveyed like three to 500 stone circles in the British Isles and, and Karnak in Brittany as well. And, and he found all these flattened circles, these egg shapes, these certain types of ellipses, all these variations were quite complicated in these stone circles. And I couldn't believe it when I applied them to Quebecly Tepic and got exactly the same ones coming out. And also the measurements. I mean, I, Finding the metrology is the same at these sites. Um, you know, the, there's certain measurement systems, like we have famously, we have the megalithic yard, which is 2.72 feet or, one point, or 0.83 meters. We have the English foot, but we also have all these different lengths of foot, uh, like the Persian foot, the Assyrian foot, the Sumerian foot, the Samian foot, all these, they're all, they're all perfect fractional relationships from the British foot. This is the real fundamentals of uh, ancient metrology developed by John Michelle and John Neal. Give them full credit here. And even uh, we're finding the Egyptian cubits. There's there's two or three different versions of the cubit, the royal cubit, the long cubit, and the, and the short cubit. There's also, and they're found at Gebekli Tepe. The Sumerian palms found there. We're finding Egyptian feet at Gebekli Tepe. And so you've you got to like, what on earth is going on here? You know, and we're talking whole numbers as well. We're not just talking random 0.6 of a, that length. We're talking whole number, perfect measurements found at Gebekli. And so a lot of these, a lot of these measurements are based on the measurements of the earth. So they must have had an understanding of earth measurements at the time, the Tepe. Otherwise, this is one of the biggest coincidences on the planet. Um, because this is just, and, and so, and then you can, you realize actually, this is where it all came together. This is where the astrology and geometry was innovated, invented. They're experimenting with all this. They were kind of creating all this and building with these design specs in mind and making sure it was preserved by before they buried the site even though some of it caved in and they had to repair it and put everything back in position there were slippages that should now be proven but then they then buried the sites to preserve their original dimensions and shapes and things like this and geometry so uh for for future reference which was a long time in the future because you have cultures forgot completely didn't know anything was there coming through the area for thousands of years no idea what was right underneath them so this is what's really interesting. It's only in the 1960s and then the 1990s that it all came to start coming to light. And so we've got a huge missing chapter of human history um, emerging from the ground in southeast Turkey. So where what is there a most prominent metrological system that we see in these sites? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, what, what, there's, there's different. I'm, st I'm still working on this. And this is my own research here. Um, I had to kind of because they haven't published any measurements of the sites accurately. I've had to kind of go into all the old, every plan I could find and work it all out. So I'm still working on it. Um, I've published some basic stuff uh, in the, some lectures, uh, but it's going to be coming out of the new book. I'm going to do a big article about it in the next couple of months as well. But yeah, we're finding, uh, it's, it's all about whole numbers. You, you, you can only use whole number measurements you're finding. But we're finding, we're, amazingly, we're finding the megalithic yard, which is 2.72 feet, which is something Alexander Tom kept finding. 
which is also related to the Spanish vara, it's a similar similar kind of length. Um, we find in the British foot everywhere. I mean, in some in some cases at Quebec Le Tepe, the British foot is like the core. It's like the kind of fundamental one. All the other foot lengths are based around. It's also um, uh, an old type of Greek foot as well. We have the Persian foot, which is one point oh five English feet, which is prominent at the site. We find that more than any other one. We have the Belgic foot and the Egyptian foot. Now you got to understand. You, you think you get. You think these are all random different foot lengths these are all related every foot length i've mentioned is related to the other one by perfect ratio of fractions so there's a whole system it's called a, a module you know which is developed by john michelle and johnny and so uh, this can all be calculated in your brain as well you don't need calculate it. you just work out the slightly different lengths based upon very simple fractions you can do it in your brain quite easily and so i so what we've now what they've now realized and they published about for many many years that stonehenge has multiple measurements in it start all stone circles the pyramid has multiple different measurements in it because they're encoding it's like different qualities into the site and you know different designers would want to focus on that particular measure later ones would want to focus on this one and so you have you have this to consider um it's not just one core measurement that answers all the questions this is where people go wrong this is why they get lost within numbers because once you have the module you understand the system and clearly these builders understood the module so they incorporated that into the sites um but you do find the megalithic yard which is outside of the module as well which is really really interesting and what has been measured like is it is it the the T pillars? Is it the walls? Is it the 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 length and width of the the enclosures? All of yeah. the above. It's mainly well. The problem is, I mean, we've it's just the enclosures at the moment. Okay. Uh, I mean, we've got a few measurements of some pillars, but they're sort of worn and broken, so it's hard. But the enclosures you can get pretty accurate measurements because they're kind of they have a bedrock curb around them. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as you find the curb where walls have been built upon like the curb the kind of raised area which is carved out of bedrock usually or terrazzo shaped just take those measurements basically and you know where you go from the back of the t-pillar or the front of the t-pillar where it touches the ground things like this um but yeah i mean we're finding a, a, well, i'm finding it to be consistent you know and i but I, i've got, got to do a bit more work on it to be honest with you yeah cool. um I, i've been distracted by other things uh but it really it, it it does make sense, especially when you understand the John Michelle John Neal modular system about how it all fits together. But we're also I'm also working with Howard Crowhurst. He's a, a master geometer. He's like, based in Britain. He's English, but he he works. He's done studies all over Britain and Karnak and even Egypt and Sumeria. Now he's applying his work to Quebec Tepe. He uses something called modular geometry which is based upon squares, double squares, triple squares, quadruple squares in rows, all perfectly north-south, just squares. That's it. It's called modular. And so the angles between like the two squares together or the three squares is slightly different, or the four squares. And he's finding that those angles and measurements of the diagonals are really important because they often mark uh, astronomical alignments as well. And so it gets it, it sounds complicated, but... Visually, it's actually quite fun, and uh, you can kind of get into it, uh, and it all kind of makes sense, you know. But it needs a bit of explanation for the per if people who haven't kind of seen or seen this before. But I think it's quite a simple system. Just need to kind of get your head around it a little bit to kind of. Um, but I would love to see um, perfect measurements actually published by the archaeologists because they haven't done that. It seems like a lot of the really good, intriguing information. Uh, about Gobekli Tepe is coming from people like you who are open-minded and who are going to these structures and who are attempting to think outside of the box a little bit about what what our ancient ancestors were capable of. I mean, where where is the where is the knowledge or the information really coming from as it relates to Gobekli Tepe? Is I guess the question, and and, and yeah, all I mean, of the ancient sites. Yeah. Yeah, there, no, there is there is a narrative put out by the archaeologists and and uh, the people working at the site, which is you know it's very cool. I mean, some of it's really cool. And Neshmi Corral, who's doing the the main dig at Karahan Tepe, is coming out with some amazing stuff. Um, I really like him. I really like what he's doing. I like what Klaus Schmidt did. I thought he was exceptional. Uh, 
whereas the people at Beckley Tepe currently were kind of, run, you know, uh, putting out the narrative about it, are very much trying to make it mundane. They're trying to make it like it's a settlement. People live there. That's it, you know, and they're not temples. They're just special buildings, you know, where, you know, people had meetings and things like this. They're trying to take away the sacred. They're saying they all had roofs. Well, there's zero evidence for any roofs. And it would, and I've been there with structural engineers and architects who said no way they had roofs. The only time, the only way they could have roofs, kind of around the edge, built upon the walls, not the T pillars. The T pillars are there are useless for roofs. They're too thin at the bottom. They're all different heights, so it'd be a really dangerous roof. Um, and there's no wood kind of being found there either. So it kind of defeats that idea. But uh, you have to question how they they keep the pillars raised up. And so they're trying to. And the reason they want there to be roofs is because it takes away all the archaeo astronomical. Right. They don't have to do uh, any work on any of that if there's if there's roofs involved. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, but, yeah, but weirdly, like because I know Andrew's done a lot of work on this. See people like um, um, Wiglow Magley. He's done the southern. He believes there's southern orientations. Whereas Andrew thinks it's all to the north, relating to Cygnus. There's other people who've looked at it as well. There's uh, Martin Sweatman has done this whole analysis of Pillar Forty Three, and uh, we found the winter solstice phenomenon at Karahan Tepe, which is, to be honest with you, I'm not just blowing our own trumpet here, but it's the most solid one because it's like absolutely fit. I mean, everything that's being illuminated through the porthole stone, the, the stone head itself, is bedrock. It ain't stones that could be moved. This is bedrock. And so you can't budge it. You know, it's fixed, and it was and it was covered over, deliberately buried, definitely. Nesham Carroll wrote a paper about this, so they preserved that alignment at the site. And we were the first ones to see in JJ back in late 2021, and so. But then they go, oh no, no, none of none of this can work. Everything had roofs, and we just say, hang on, are you sure about this? Because um, there's no, I mean, and then so what we did is we actually got. Um, I worked with a, a very 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 talented guy called Kevin Esslinger. He's a, he's a creative 3D digital artist. And he, and through drone footage and some scans I did at the site, he put together a 3D uh, replica of Karahan Tepe. He, and, I, and, I, and I even asked him to put the night sky in using a Stellarium as it was 9000 BC. Um, so he did all this analysis. We, we've got all the stones where they would be at Karahan Tepe. Where they, how they, and weirdly, the sunrise light would come through the two central T-pillars of the main enclosure, then go through the porthole stone, then light up the stone head perfectly. You know, it just all worked. And we're like, wow. So let's, so let's try it with a roof on it. And so he put a, a kind of idea, a hypothesis of a roof on top of it. And just by having certain you know, gaps between T-pillars and, you know, just the, the structure of the roof without a covering, the light would still come through. And even if you put a covering over it and left certain windows in it, the light of the winter solstice would perfectly come through and still illuminate the stone head. So we realised, oh, we cracked something here because even now the archaeologists and the other people who are dismissing this can't say that anymore because we've proven beyond doubt that even with the roof, and you have to have openings in roofs in certain places, just natural way of creating these ancient types of roofs. It still works. And so, um, yeah, so but so they're trying to... One of the things they're, they're putting out with all the uh, artwork and promotion of the Beckley Tepe is they all had roofs, so it defeats the whole object of any archaeoastronomy. And I think that's a problem because archaeoastronomy is everywhere. We know it. It's, it's, it's an established discipline. In archaeology, Stonehenge, uh, even at the pyramids, the Giza Plata, all over the world, at ancient sites, this is part of it. Newgrange is the most famous winter solstice one. And so we know it's it's a reality. So so the fact that we discovered this winter solstice thing is really odd because it, it's been completely ignored by the archaeologists. They don't want anything to do with it. Our good friend Ishmael at the site, who runs a site, we've known him since like you know 10 years or so, He's not allowed to say anything about it. Um, even when I took my book there, I got a photo with Ishmael and his dad, who who owns the land. They got we got asked to remove it because they don't want to have anything to do with these alternative wow. ideas. So, so I've already got it banned before I've even probably published it. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, never mind. Uh, but this is so. This is the problem. You know, so there's a lot. There's also a lot of some political stuff going on in Turkey. 
it, it kind of you know so there's a religious thing there's, there's all these different things that we don't really see we just want to crack on and, and do our research and, and, uh, and make it public where it's a little bit different they have to kind of tread carefully and they don't want to upset um, certain people i guess yeah and the the alignment with that face on the winter solstice would have been even more perfect 11 or twelve thousand years ago is that correct it, it would have been That's a, right. a bit higher that on the right. face yeah. Yeah, we did a whole analysis of it. We we worked. I worked with uh, Andrew on this, and also Rodney Hale, who's uh, an archaeo astronomer, also an engineer. He's done lots of archaeo astronomy over the last forty years or so, and we analysed it carefully in Stellarium. Then we had Kevin Esslinger recreate it with a reconstruction of the site with and without a roof, and everything. It just worked. I mean, basically, because the sun's only moved about one and a half okay. sunwards. Mm-hmm. If that, so it's a tiny amount. It's like a degree, a degree and a half or something. It's this very small amount. And so what we realized is, is that back then, we put where the sunrise would be back then, and it comes through the hole even better and illuminates more of the stone head, slightly more. It's only a tiny amount of difference. And we're just lucky it works now because otherwise we wouldn't have even anything about it because it doesn't work till, it's like 10 minutes after sunrise it kicks in mm-hmm. i think back then it would have been like five minutes so it's basically sunrise and then it kicks in and it it works and for 45 minutes this blade of light moves around the head like this it's yeah. like what the hell and we witnessed it we went there again the following year i managed to film it and record it now they don't want you going there on a win you know that time of year mm-hmm. they, they've they sort of block it a little bit, mm-hmm. but yeah. So this is really important. I, w- I wish they make a big deal out of it, not because we. It's a you know, huge we, deal. We just because it's like you know it, it'll make people want to go there and visit the site yeah. and be there for when something spectacular happens. Yeah, and you can still today. It's not like it's it's gone out of sync. It's like still in line, and I think that's what's really cool. And I think you know they should make like new grains. They have a thing there where you have to kind of go in for this raffle. So you, like 20 people can go and see this, thousands of people apply. They can go and witness it over a few, and you can do it over a few mornings. It's not one, when the solstice is like, reaches the most southern point of the horizon, the sun does. And solstice literally means standstill. So it stay, it rises in the same position, more or less, for about four days, maybe five days, really, it will still work, up until Christmas Day. And then it starts going back slightly further north on the horizon every morning. So you can have three or four days there, special access visits they could charge for it whatever to go and witness this this phenomenon and and this and it's technically it's the earliest winter solstice alignment anywhere on the planet yeah the only other one close to that is a summer solstice sunset alignment at jericho which was discovered by a very very interesting fellow um um ram bakai who's a brilliant archaeologist out there um and and that, that's 8400 bc and so it's a thousand years later but and so and that was an academic peer reviewed paper and it was accepted that they were recording the summer solstice sunset which is exactly opposite to the winter solstice sunrise mind you it's the same alignment right, right. and and uh, so yeah so you've got this and so although we're not academics we've still published it on academia.org um and done it as a proper paper and a lot of, I know a lot of archaeologists have read it because you get kind of little notifications who's who's read it. And so we left it up there. And we're going to do an update on that with the roof analysis, which we didn't have then, which we have now, to say, look, it does work even with the roof. Uh, and we even had uh, Martin Sweatman come and speak at our conference about this in Megalithomania in May. And and I said, he said, he, he said, like the reason he didn't accept it is because it had a roof. And I'm like, oh, that's why it's not being picked up by so many people because everyone thinks there was a roof, even though there's no evidence of a roof anywhere. So this is why we've got to re- rewrite the update on it and publish it again with the roof hypothesis proving that it works even with a roof, even though we don't even think there was a roof and there's no evidence for one, which is bizarre, but this is the way it goes. And so, yeah, so there's there's all these little details you have to kind of go into um, nowadays if you want to get anything like that accepted. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, like, why wouldn't we just assume there, it, it just seems lazy. I, I mean, just to say, oh, there was a, a roof up there and, and so we don't have to do any work to determine whether or not they were using astronomical alignments in any way. Like, it just seems lazy. It seems like 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 it's it's a it's an easy thing to say. We we know this is the case and therefore it eliminates all of these possibilities. But but that's why your discovery is so big, because it 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 shines a, a bright light 
on the fact that, hey, these people could tell what was happening with the sun and, and, the, and the moon, and, and they, were, they were measuring the patterns. And, and why is that so difficult for people to believe, by the way? Like, why, why is it yeah. so hard to believe that we could tell when the sun is at its lowest point in the sky, what day that occurs, and when the sun is at its highest point in the sky? I mean, that is not very... Um, very difficult to to really ascertain from a I mean if you're if you're a human being these are very very easy things to see with your eyes so why why do you think there's so much resistance to the idea th that that our ancient ancestors were um, a bit more observant than we give them credit for it's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I I, I don't know uh, to be honest with you. I think it's I think it comes down to like understanding as well. I just if you're not into or understand archaeoastronomy, which I, I don't know if archaeologists are trained in this or what, um, then it's hard to for them to, you know, accept other people who, who've studied it for years to come in and say, oh, actually, this this is happening here. Um, and I think the problem is there's so many people have put ideas and speculations on Gebekli Tepe over the years. Um, it's hard to prove a lot of them because they're based on star movements um, like Cygnus or Sirius uh, to the Cygnus to the north, Sirius to the south. Um, there's a lot of debate about them. I mean, I think Andrew Collins' stuff is excellent and Grigolo Magli, I think they're both onto something. Also, I want to credit J.J. Ainsworth, who's put it all together at Gebekli Tepe, which is going to publish in our book, which we, we, we keep in partly under wraps, um, which is like the whole movement of the sky is recorded in the stones at Gebekli Tepe in a profound way. Um, and also possibly um, we, we're finding it, she's finding evidence of it at, at Karahan Tepe as well. And, um, but yeah, but when you, it, it, it's so, so you can understand they just get overwhelmed by all these different theories coming in. So they want to just, yeah. Put, a, put a lid on it, literally a roof on it, and just forget about it, because then because none of it is is really a hundred percent just yet. But this winter solstice thing is a hundred percent, and I think that's what is really, you know, annoying the people over there, <laughs> because it's it's pretty solid. And you go there yeah. today, and you'll see it on the winter solstice. It's not like we we we're, we're, we're fudging it, you know. You know, we're not, we're not, we haven't moved any stones or anything, you know, to make it work. It's, it's there and it works. And so, so that I think is, is, it, it's, it's going to, every winter solstice is going to happen for the next hundred or hundreds of years, whether they like it or not. Right. That face that gets lit up on the winter solstice sits above a, an area that looks as if it, it was dug out of the bedrock and, and that pillars were, were left in the bedrock and it yeah. almost looks like it, it it was filled with water at some point in time or, and and so i wonder you, you mentioned the air conditioning and how the our, our ancient ancestors were using water and flowing water to cool buildings and potentially this this is the first evidence of an ancient air conditioning but how deep does this water conversation at gobekli tepe and other sites that are similar to it go. I mean, could could these could some of these enclosures have been completely filled with water? In uh, Gebekli Tepe and at Karahan Tepe, uh, the problem with the water theory is that they were harvesting rainwater. That's all they had. Apparently, there's no natural springs or rivers or streams anywhere near either of these two sites. Now, many of the other sites there are, like at Navali Churi, Cheyano, uh, Tigris River sites um, and a uh, and La Hoyaka, an, under, an unexcavated site has a spring uh, which feeds actually Chandler. So the other sites had it, but these two for some reason don't and didn't. Like, there's no real evidence they had any natural water source anywhere nearby. But there's good evidence that they were very smart and they were collecting and harvesting rainwater. It's something that Lee Clare, who's the, one of the archaeologists at Gebekli Tepe, has written about. And it makes sense. They've got these huge kind of bell-shaped underground things with big slabs on top to protect them. The water would collect. They have channels carved out to collect it as well. So they were certainly trying to preserve and use water. It really does. It looks like there's water erosion it looks like that, but, not, but no one's really sure because they can't understand it. They could collect enough rainwater for that to to work. That's one of that's one of the big questions. Although there are many underground bell-shaped 
water collection chambers uh, on the opposing hill called Ketchley Tepe as well. And so, yeah, and but one of the, you know, if you actually look at it um, you know, next to what's called structure AB with the, the, the pillars and the head, yeah. there's a lot of channel coming into it. And on the other side of it, there's the porthole stone. And below the other side of the porthole stone in a main enclosure is a big kind of area in the ground, a well, just a big hole where water would, could move through one to the other and collect and then fill up that area there. And so I've got a feeling that they, 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 whenever they could, they they had water, they, they, they worked with it. Um, and so I really think there's something in there, but I think they had to harvest the rainwater. They, they couldn't, there wasn't any local springs or waterways that they could actually get the, the water from itself. Although, like I said, the other settlements were right next to the water, which were much more to my opinion, much more domestic sites. These were special use sites, in my opinion, which goes against what the archaeologists are saying. So here's a crazy idea <laughs> that, that I'd love to just just have you consider for a second. And thinking about that, that guy whose face gets lit up on the winter solstice and what that could mean and why he's sitting above a pool of, of an area that looks like it could be filled with water. And then as you just mentioned, you've got these channels and the channel would come in from an area that doesn't look like there's a real water source over there to fill up this, this tub. And what could all of this, and then why would it be flowing into another tub if there's not really a, 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 a stream or a source of water? Where's all this water coming from? And then what if this site, the, the origins of this site, not the walls that have been dated to 11,600 years ago, but, but the origins of the site were significantly, significantly older, going back to the Ice Age. What if the water source was when there was a massive glacier over, um, over the, the northern hemisphere and... And you're talking about a mile high um, ice sheet, and um, and 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 during the winter solstice, the, uh, the the sun comes in, it lights up this guy's face. That's the coldest day of the year. We know it's going to start to warm up after this. We know the glaciers are going to start to melt. We know that this area is going to start to fill up with water. Um, because as the glaciers melt, they were harvesting glacier water as it began to melt off of the ice cap and fill up a lot of these ancient sites. Is that even like, so, so I know it, it, that, that, that if you look at that latitude, it would be uh, around where um, the northern part of the United States is. And we had a glacier that extended all the way down just below the Canadian border. So it's not that far of a stretch to think that potentially at some point in our ancient history, this area of the world may have had an ice sheet on top of it. We don't necessarily exactly know where the ice sheets came to. Could they have been harvesting glacier water annually as the ice sheets melted a bit and filled up some of these structures to use for bathing, for cleaning, for drinking, for um, even drinking even the water for the for the year potentially, or for giving for childbirth, for um, you know for all of these things that a civilization would need water from? Could they have been harvesting glacier water? I guess is my my question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, right? I've never heard anybody mention this. No, it's. I mean, maybe you've you've nailed it. I mean, you know, maybe you've just nailed it. Maybe that's exactly what they were doing. I mean, I just don't know if they. I mean, some else mentioned this recently. They they commented on one of my videos. I think I did recently, and said, "What about glacier water?" So it's, it's some people. Some pe other people are thinking about okay. it. Okay. Okay. Uh, because because they believe it's older as well, and so. It could well be. I mean, I, I I got a feeling as well. If you look at the climate, um, right at the beginning of when it warmed up, it was wetter. Um, this is what a lot of people keep telling me. Uh, some research backs this up. I know one of the archaeologists put this out as well. It was slightly wetter, and so there was more rain to collect. At, at but this was at certain times a year, and uh, not all year round. And so I think this is why I believe as well. Um, You've got, you know, cyclical use of these sites, like specifically going into the winter solstice area, 
zone, which I believe was a, me and JJ have written a, a couple of articles on Graham Hancock's website about this, but we believe it's a fertility site. We believe water was used. We believe the winter solstice was part of this, and it could have actually been um, other astronomical things going on there as well. Andrew Collins has found a few things there as well, um, as, which sort of back up the winter solstice thing as well. And so, yeah, I, I think... Uh, I think there might have been more water. Now, I don't know about the glacial thing. I mean, it could well be. I mean, they could find evidence of much earlier dates, which which might support your new hypothesis. Okay. Yeah, but 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 there's no current uh, explanation for how those areas could have been completely filled with water. Is that correct? I mean, there's no there's no streams. There's not enough really rain. I mean, you're up at the top of a hill to to really fill those things with with water as they appear to have been intended i mean it, it appears that they're intentionally designed to be tubs or pools in a couple of those cases especially the guy with the with the sun on his face in the winter solstice yeah. i mean you know but but there's not am i am i correct that there's not a natural source of water around there that could have been used for for completely filling that up no, there's, I don't think there is. I mean, yeah. according to the data, I mean, we, we, we tried to look into it as much as we could. There's definitely none there now. I mean, the closest source is Chandler, for, or it's a place called Sogmata Oasis, which is like 30 or 25 miles away. Um, but some people have suggested there could have been ancient springs which are completely dried up. Um, but there would be some evidence of them in the geology there, which there isn't. And mm. so um, at the moment... We're drawing a blank on it, um, but we, you know, I think when now now there's evidence of harvesting rainwater at Beckley Tepe, then we think that must have been what was going on. But it's just baffling, you know. Why, you know, yeah. Then you have to question why would they build these sites in these remote high areas, not near water? You know what? What was the? You know, how could mm -hmm. you? Why would you want to live there? Why wouldn't you want to live where the, the flowing water is and where we could survive easier? like uh, where many of these other sites are. So to me, this is why I believe these are very special sites. They, they weren't used like the more domestic, the, the settlements were used. I think these were like, you know, where the real priestly elites might go or the shamans. And there'd be maybe a few people up there all year round keeping an eye on it and looking after it, cleaning it up, things like that. Um, maybe collecting the water from the local systems which were built into the bedrock, bringing it out for certain ceremonies and rituals at certain times of year so i think to me that's more like it you know that's, that's that's my kind of feeling on it yeah cool yeah that makes sense yeah and 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 you asked the question why why would you want to be up in that area anyway what would be about that area that could help your survival as an as an as a human and and man i mean that's a beautifully clean source of just fresh water just just pure fresh clean water potentially you know coming off of the off of an ice sheet so it's interesting to think about I, I, if if um, if the audience can let me know what you think in the comments because i was thinking about doing a uh, crazy idea series on this as a as a new idea that i haven't heard anybody else mention i was it's unfortunate that you said somebody made a comment on it because at least one other person has, has has thought of this but but it's it's it seems like a possibility that's worth exploring anyway but but um, yeah, moving past that, maybe a bit. What about the stone plates? And to find the plates um, was a big discovery and a big surprise to a lot of people. And I think when you when you look at people that are that are interested in the vase work and potentially exploring alternatives for how old a lot of the stone vases might be, and potentially those being heirlooms. Uh, and given to the Egyptian people. Well, that was that that was um, very much laughed at early on by a lot of people. And, you know, I think it's it's still, you know, we still don't know uh, for sure. But but this discovery of these plates coming out of Gobekli Tepe, I mean, if they were capable of 11 or 12, 12,000 years ago making hard stone plates out of granite, why couldn't they have made a, a, a jar, a vessel, a, uh, you know, a, a, what we might refer to as a vase today out of granite? Yeah. So, yeah, if you could, could you talk a little bit about that discovery and what you think it means? What's the importance of it? Yeah, okay. Karahan Tepe, um, they found a few at Quebecli Tepe as well, but they weren't really um, publicized. They found some at Yan La Hoyak as well. Um, but the ones at Karahan Tepe, the, the initial excavations 
they found them on the on the sort of benches, if you like, or the kind of areas between the T pillars and the outer ring. They would find these plates placed, you know, specifically placed in areas um, as though they were very they were sacred. They weren't just used for they weren't just dinner plates and things like this. They were they were used for something ceremonial. Um, some of them are like, you know, one and a half feet wide, two feet wide. Um, some they're all different kind of the ones I've seen. There's only like six or seven on display. And we had a geologist come and look at them as well um, when he was with us in May. And yeah, and he just said what we thought all along. That some of them are, are there's like two types of basalt. There's like a granite type thing. They could, he couldn't work out really what it was, whether it was granodiorite or something like this. But some of them are extremely dark, darker than the basalt which you get from Karakadar Mountain, uh, which is to the northeast uh, from Gebekli Tepe. Um, and they found also um, some of them were broken, but some of them, one, one of them is like, so they've got perfect kind of really round them, the kind of little edges. They're really kind of precise, oddly precise. And, you know, maybe, like I say, not to the level of the Egyptian vase, vases and things like this, but one of them has a kind of cut mark, beautifully smoothed out into the middle perfectly. Like it, like, like they've softened it and just smoothed it out. And like mm. this little cut mark, this little indentation, perfectly circular blending back into the plate which again is just I mean, how on earth would you do that um and then recently in a new area they've just excavated at Karahan Tepe they call it the kitchen because they found a kiln in it which I believe was probably used to make the terrazzo floor they found um Anatolian viper snake bones in it and other animals and they found a whole cache of plates which hopefully are going to be on display when we go there in, sept, uh, in a couple of months. Um, because, and that, you know, they say it's the kitchen where they prepared food, but I'm thinking, who eats snakes, you know? And so, you know, is this actually a ceremonial area? It's what Andrew and, and our friend Debbie Cartwright called an alchemical kitchen, more likely. You know, this is like where they produce, you know, the different sacraments and things like this, even medicines. Um, and the plates may have been part of that. But yeah, I mean, I've got a question for you because what is because I've heard that Ben was telling me some of these old vases from Egypt are from uh, extremely ancient sites that go back to the same era as Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe. Now, is that correct? Yeah, Ben Ben has found an image of a burial that appears to have stone vases in it that look to be of the type that the Egyptians were um, are credited for, and the burial dates to something like eleven thousand or twelve thousand years ago, and so yeah. so. Yeah, I mean, if that image is is real and 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 authentic, and it's an authentic burial, then it certainly seems to indicate that that uh, that these were around for a lot longer than we think. So, yeah, that's a big piece of evidence. I haven't personally seen it. I've just seen it in the videos that Ben's put out, but it's very compelling. Yeah, no, I mean, again, we've got this connection with the ancient Egypt, you see, because there are pre-pottery Neolithic areas in Egypt. I think one of the sites called Kosh, Koshka or something. Um, I forget the name of it. And um, this is where this vase apparently was found in this very ancient burial. But remember, I mentioned the Helwan points, the kind of arrowheads, the microblade technology. We get the same ones in Channel Urfa, a place called Yemen Hali, as you do in ancient Egypt, the same era and so there was obviously some kind of connection between these two and so were they were the kind of master masons who could work the stone working you know in and out of these areas you know make, makes you wonder and I, I think um you know again this whole new cache of plates um i haven't really seen them close up again it's just like you know why not if, if these are just eating vessels why go to so much trouble um to make them. and also some of them were deliberately broken and, and and left on the benches at the end of their use before the site was covered up hmm. as well so you got like a to me that's more uh, pr provable ceremonial use yeah what are the tool marks like on some of the plates like do, do you see tool marks because in a lot of the in a lot of the the vases just horizontal tool marks on the interior and you never see tool marks on the exterior of them on the outside walls but always on the interior which well it gives you clues as to how they were how they were potentially made but do we see do we see tool marks on the plates 
I think there are, yeah, I think you can see them. And some of them are kind of weathered weirdly as well. They're kind of weathered and some are that most of them are broken and put back together, yep. should add. Um, but the, some of them have been clearly polished. You know, you can see there's polishing. I think, you know, the one with the cut mark in it is, like, really baffling because that, that seems to be, like... I mean, they, they must have used obsidian for the fine work on them. Um, but, again, it's like some of this stone looks harder than limestone. So, it, again... It's hard to tell. I mean, they're they're not even telling us what they're made of, you know, officially. Right. There's no official thing. Although I think there's a mention that they came from Karakadar Mountain, which is the basalt kind of volcano to the north where the first acorn wheat was ever developed. Um, and so it, 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 that was deemed as the sacred mountain, if you like. We went up there last time we were there, actually. It's like vast amounts of basalt thrown about everywhere. Um, but I think there are tool marks. So, uh, and I think this was like, these were like the kind of almost like amulets of the elites there. I think these were their special objects. Like you get in Britain and Scotland, you have these sort of carved stone spheres, which are like beautifully geometric, you know, from the Bronze Age, Neolithic, Ascara Bray and other places, or Nessa Brodga in Orkney. I think these were like their kind of um, ceremonial kind of, special objects you know that that, that the elites would uh, carry about and maybe bring i mean maybe they're they're made from lots of some people have suggested their stone comes from different areas so these were different cult tribes or whatever coming in with their kind of gifts of the stone plates made of their local kind of stone did you mention earlier that there was a time of the year when we're told what has been excavated what has been learned whether it's new new plates new bowls is it september did you say that that all of that information is released yeah generally it's late september early october uh, the last couple of years especially um this is because the dig season ends at the end of september this is like uh, they, they start like around may or june and really only do it till then i think sometimes at Quebec Lee Tepe they keep it going a bit further because they've got the roof and everything um and they, they actually cover up parts of the site in early october um, sometimes, you know, because they because they they kind of leave it alone and just have a couple of guards there, which you can still visit like Carahan Tepe. Um, and, but so you have to kind of it's best to go before they do that because you know you get to see all the new stuff and and often you know there's they make a big big deal out of it. So we're going to hopefully be there for that. You know, even though they don't like us very much, we're still going to turn up and uh, <laughs> um, and go see what we can see. Um, but a few things. You know, even from last uh, the last dig season. I mean, even no, there's even stuff coming out already. They, they they've kind of uh, started to release a few things. They've started like Gebekli Tepe excavating enclosure B, the northern section of it. This is one of the main enclosures. Actually, it's one of the geometries I've looked at, and I'm but I'm I'm really delighted because they're going to move away a lot of the rubble and the wall and actually see. I want to see where the T pillars are. Uh, in enclosure B, because I'm going to work out if there's any geometry associated with that. So that's that they're actually doing that. Um, but it's very slow work at Quebec Lee Tepe for some reason. Um, I mean, I know uh, Jimmy Corsetti put a thing out about it, a big kind of uh, scandal about them not excavating it, WEF involvement, and things like this. And that that, that is it's kind of that is valid, that is interesting. But thankfully, they are. It seems they are digging a little bit more uh, there. I just I, I really do hope. With Carahan Tepe, they don't stop. They just crack on. And I think Neshmi Corral's got it in his mind that head archaeologists, that they've got to get the whole site done. You know, it really needs to be done um, because of, um, you know, before they can kind of think about, you know, halting any excavations there. Yeah. Do you, do you think that everyone is being completely forthright with the that that with the information that that the world is being given with the things that have been dug up with what we know about it? Do you think that all of the information is being given out or do you think that there's anything that's being held back from any of these sites? Yeah, I totally believe that stuff's being held back. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the fact that we, you know, we're going out there and, and discovering a half a tea pillar lying on the ground, yeah. an excavated site, uh, we're finding tunnels, you know, near other sites that could be thousands of years old, carved out of solid bedrock. Um, 
Yeah, I think so, yeah. I mean, you're not allowed to go to certain areas of Gobekli Tepe unless you're friends with the archaeologist. Um, and I think that's unfortunate because it, it, it blocks, you know, it's it, it's blocking research. I mean, they've got a whole, whole areas of Gobekli Tepe with roofs on no one's allowed to go to. It's bizarre. And like you know, you, you question why don't they just lay down a path to those areas and have guard there so people can at least have a look? Because it's like, why not? What 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 you're hiding? You know, it's like it's just it's just weird. It's kind of weirdly kind of insular. Um, and even Karahan Tepe uh, is a little bit more open. Um, you can go, you kind of walk around most of the site now, but they don't let you see certain things until they're ready to see it. Um, that's the way it works there. Um, so we try and stick. To, you know, we're very we want to climb over and see everything. That's, that's our kind of nature, but we do stick by the rules to maintain good relations out there. And um, yeah, and it's just, uh, I think like, like I say, the, towards the end of the dig season, this is when the new stuff gets um, kind of revealed. Mm -hmm. And even though we've seen photos of a lot of the new artifacts, a lot of them still aren't in the museum yet, which is strange because I've seen particular photos of artifacts I have in my lecture, for instance, I've actually illustrated them for my little wooden book. Um, they're still not on display, which is which is kind of strange. And, so, and some of the stuff they do find at some of the sites, they rebury, take a few photos of it, then rebury it for some reason. Hmm. This is known at Quebecly Tepe. They've done that with some really amazing pieces. Yeah, it's just like why wouldn't you want the information to be out there unless it's unless it's in conflict with what the existing narrative of our history is. I mean, unless there's something different and unique that we've discovered or learned that we don't think people are ready for, why would we hide? Why would, why would people hide information from, from the world, from, from being able to learn what our ancestors were actually capable of? It's, it's just one of those people things that's very, very frustrating that when people attempt to, to conceal or hide information and you, you hate to talk about it because you sound like a conspiracy theorist, but, but, uh, yeah, in a lot of, in a lot of places, in a lot of cases, it seems like that's what's happening. And, and, um, yeah, for me, this one seems, uh, smells a little fishy too. It's like, why, why wouldn't we just keep digging and continue to excavate and just put this on the, on display for the entire world to see so that we can learn? Yeah, I think I think there's there's two sides to that. I think um, it's not just one archaeologist um, making those rules. I think there's people above him. There's the government. There's um, different influences they have to kind of adhere to. Um, it's a world heritage site as well. You know things like this. So yeah, there's lots of different things. You know why that might be happening, um, but I think. Um, Fundamentally, uh, I agree with you. I think you know, you know, this is an exciting time of discovery. Let's get it yeah. all out there. I mean, because they're gonna clearly they're not going to excavate the whole of Gobekli Tepe. They've said that openly. They've actually said that they're going to do some more, uh, but they're going to leave it to future generations when the, they say when the technology improves. I mean, this is what's happening at a place in Orkney called the Nessa Brodgar, um, which is a major discovery. It's been excavated for the last 10, 15 years. I've been up there like six times. I've had a look at it. And they're going to cover that over and bury it, yeah. which is, what the hell? Yeah. It's like, what is wrong with you? Just why don't you just put a, you know, a nice roof on it, build a structure around it, and have it open to the public? What, why would you rebury it? Right. And they seem to think that's a good idea. Mm. Uh, it's, 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 to me, it's all backwards, that, that side of things. You know, we have the technology, we have the funds to preserve these sites, dig them up, and, and protect them as well. So what's, what's, what's stopping that? Yeah, what didn't we cover? What do you think is, is the, I mean, we talked about a lot. We talked about cement, we talked about alcohol, or, uh, we talked about um, uh, stone plates, we talked about the, the, the winter solstice. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of, lot of great knowledge here. Anything that we did not cover that you think is, is worth going over? Um, I think we did cover quite a bit, actually. Mm. Um, obviously, I think we mentioned the geometry already. Um, but I think I think the key is is that um, there's some very strange pieces coming out. I mean, one of the things that fascinates me, actually, yeah, we can mention this. Is I mentioned it, Jay, JJ and I wrote about this in our article that in the Bali Churi, there's a uh, a head, like it's probably part of a taller statue, which has this serpent ponytail going down the back which is just like a vedic priest ponytail from india and then recently so i'm looking at haircuts now for some some weird reason and then the new statue at karahan tepe seven and a half feet tall this new he's holding his phallus 
He's kind of, you know, very excited. He's got ribs. He's got like a beard, like an Egyptian kind of fake beard on him with a V-neck underneath it. But his hair is like kind of shaved around the ears here, shaved all around here. Mm-hmm. And he's got this whole mullet kind of thing going back and then flat on the bottom. And so we're looking at now, we're starting to get an impression of what these people look like, which I think is really fascinating. Um, and the fact that this statue is seven and a half feet tall is pretty impressive because many of the other statues, like Earth of Man or what's called the Belictal statue, which is 8,400 BC, that was found in Shandlerfa with a site there that's now been built over. Um, that was a life size statue, whereas this is seven and a half feet tall. So, is that life size? Were the people very tall back then? So, this this, this is asking, starting to ask a lot of questions about what, what these people look like. But it seems like they had crazy cool haircuts. That's one thing. <laughs> and uh, the fact is, and also we're finding lots of Vedic connections with the site, something I'm, I'm looking into. There's an author called B.G. Siddharth who wrote about the Vedic connection to, to Navali Churi. And, and Ve- this, I'm sorry, but Vedic is like a, a Hindu? Um, like yeah, in, ancient Indian. Hindu, yeah. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, and um, and even the the astronomy matches some of it as well now. Um, and BG Siddharth was one of the main promote, proponents. They was writing about this in the nineteen nineties, late nineties. Our friend Charles Koss made a video claiming that the pillar shrine or structure may be with all the phallic pillars and a stone head. It's actually like a Shiva lingam, like a represent an early representation of a Shiva lingam, which is a fertility kind of. Um, cult kind of thing which we still have in india i've been went to india in february for a few weeks and saw all these shivalingas and to me it was just like my god these are like kind of progression from what we're finding in southeast turkey and and so there's there's all these connections that haven't quite been properly made yet uh which are starting to kind of come together and i think i think that's going to be very compelling over the next few years as more discoveries get made and prove these points i've been mentioning well, yeah, fascinating. I mean, the so this is this is kind of the ancient lost civilization, I think, in in, in your mind anyway, and, and I think in a lot of people's minds that that everyone is looking for, like that. What well, here it is. It's like it, we've got all of the we've got all we've got everything. I mean, as much as we could possibly have left over from a civilization that existed over eleven thousand years ago, we have, which is essentially rocks and stones and structures. I mean, is that where is that where your head is with with the importance of what it is that we're finding here? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's it's too compelling to like not focus on it for me. I just can't take my mind off it. It's it's where it's happening. I mean, Egypt is amazing. Peru is amazing. You know, Stonehenge is amazing. All these kind of sites, but everyone's worked on them for years. You know, there's millions of books and pro, you know projects and research and analysis and everything else. This is all. This is literally the time of discovery. This is why I find it so interesting that we're discovering things. When we every time we go out there, we're finding new things. Sometimes making our own discoveries, which is like amazing. You can't really do that in, in Egypt or Peru so much. It's you know, it's not like. But so, and the age of it is just ridiculous. You know, we're finding it's twice as old as the Giza pyramids, at least at least twice as old as Stonehenge. <laughs> and so it's just the age of it doesn't make any sense, especially now we're considering these are actually older than what we're being told as well. And so I think, um, you know, I, I just urge people to just to ha- just turn their eyes and have a look at it because this is, um, you know, this is where it's, to me, this is where it's all happening. And I think it's, I think the next few years are going to be critical and it might give us some deeper deeper understanding of who we are and where we came from yeah i'd love to have you back on after september when when these things are when when they release the new um findings and talk about some of the uh, some of the amazing discoveries that have happened um over the last year so do you do you envision this as like a you know, again, I go back to what could our ancient ancestors have been doing? What what were all these people doing in all of these different in, little enclosures, which are almost like little rooms? I mean, do you envision that that people could have been teaching a class about astronomy or math or geometry in, in some of these places? And they could have been uh, childbirth in other places and performing surgeries in other places and bathing in other places. And, and I mean, could this have been um, hospitals and all of the basics of what we would consider civilization today? 
I mean, it, it just seems like we've got all of these different compartments. They're all built a little bit differently. Potentially, each of them had a different end use. Could this have been just a civilization of people that were living together who built all of these different areas and all these different rooms in order to, 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 to enhance their civilization, enhance their knowledge, teach their children, birth children as effectively and safely as possible, you know, um, cure, cure illness and treat illness and disease and, and just, just, just accomplish all of the things that we might think of as, as civilization today and what we're accomplishing today. I mean, is that kind of how you envision these, all of these sort of sites that are scattered around this geographical area that that seem to all be connected? Yeah, I th- yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I, th- I think these were places of teaching. I think these were what are called memory spaces. Uh, this is like a, the nature of pre-literate societies. Although there's, but I, I believe there's evidence there now of um, they were trying to develop language you know you can see that in some of the the symbols which jj has been working on and i think you know the memory space idea was actually put forward by klaus schmidt originally and and it was developed by um an author as well i I forget her name lynn um someone and and this makes sense because it's like you go into these you know you you go into like these enclosures like you got a reconstruction of enclosure d actually at the chandler for museum which is incredible and you go in there and you think you realize these are important sacred spaces this is like a it's like a kind of cathedral is that massive they're like 18 foot tall pillars it's like unbelievable and it seems like you could just go around to each section where people sit and around the benches telling stories and information from one pillar which is encoded so only maybe the elites would understand it on some levels but then they would then be able to go and teach the initiates to come in and We'll look at this and maybe that time of year this one gets lit up by the sunrise so we'll talk about this and it's all designed in this astronomical configuration in my opinion um and certain things would get lit up at certain times of year that's when the teaching would go to that part your teachings about animals there's different animals and what's dangerous uh, you know and what things like this astronomy uh, like you say medicine especially with the new discovery at Cameron Tepe this sort of alchemical kitchen potentially um, where they were preparing all these different um, strange medicines. Um, but, yeah, I think it's, it all makes sense. And I think they were also ritual spaces. They were also communal spaces. They were also, you know, where people would gather and have meetings because there's, you know, and and, and would, would give recitals and song and dance even. It's highly likely because you flatten in the floor. You've got all this space. It's quite a lot of space in these enclosures. You can dance around. The acoustics are amazing. There's been a lot of research done on the acoustics now where if you stand in the middle, everyone can hear you around the edge and it would echo around really beautifully. Um, and so there could have been oracle spaces as well where they're receiving information, you know. Um, and so it, all sorts of possibilities. And I think all of them are valid. I think they're all as valid as one another. And we shouldn't just accept what's on Wikipedia now, which is just that they're... They're called special buildings where people would meet up and do certain things. I think there's a lot more to it than that. I think these, you know, you can see that in, just in the carvings, in the symbolism, in the innovation, you know, all the discoveries there. It's like these weren't mundane places. These were very, very special sacred places. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, fantastic. Really good stuff. Really appreciate it. Appreciate your time. I know we've we've uh, this time has flown by, so we're already a couple hours in. It doesn't seem like it yet, but I know that we have covered a lot. Any final thoughts before we um, we we kind of close it out? Yeah, I just I just urge people to um, you know look into these places and keep an eye on what's coming out because of the the nature of it is that this is the time of discovery, um, and also I think you've got to keep an open mind about. Um, you know, don't allow, I think this is in a general sense, don't, don't allow the narrative to be um, just what you see on Wikipedia, but I think most people don't really take much notice of that too much nowadays. No. There's a lot more to these places than meets the eye. And I think, you know, this could open up a whole doorway. I mean, imagine, you know, just think about all the history books that are now being rewritten. Really it's, it's crazy um, because of these discoveries. And so and I think when we start looking into the area beyond that zone, beyond the Taz Tepela region, we're going to find a much grander network which was prevalent and possibly 
even influencing the whole planet at, you know going over the few thousand years since it was built and i think uh this is something we get, we're looking into me and jj ainsworth for our next uh book our next project cool nice nice well, how can people get uh how can people follow you how can people follow your work sure they can get this this is my little book Beckley Tepe and Karen Tepe, the world's first megaliths. That's uh, available. It's got loads of cool illustrations in it. We cover everything we've covered today. Um, I think it's going to be available in America. There's a new edition in America coming out very soon. Um, yeah, it's just a fantastic little read, a fun little read, but covers a lot. We, we go for it. Um, but yeah, a lot of our research, they can get through just by searching for Hugh Newman or megalithomania.co.uk. Um, and, um, yeah, we've got a lot of stuff up online, uh, events. We do events like conferences. We've got one coming up in November, uh, called the origins conference in Wiltshire, England. Uh, we've got some fantastic speakers, myself and Andrew and JJ and, and, and several others. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, uh, we obviously we do tours twice a year to this area as well. And we, we have to do these things to, we don't have any funding or anything like that. This is our, this is our, this is our career, our job. We focus on it hundred percent. So we rely on these, um, you know, this, this kind of little bits of income to kind of fund our research and projects because, uh, this is, uh, the only way we can really do that. And, and we, and we, and we like being, we like staying independent as well. We like being independent researchers, like focusing on what we want to focus on without too much outside influence. Um, I think that's important. Yeah. And so, yeah, people can just check out megalithomania.co.uk or search for me, uh, Hugh Newman. Love it. Love it. Great. Yeah. Good stuff. Great job at the cosmic summit. It was a really impressive uh, presentation that you gave there and it, it made me want to connect. And, and, uh, I know usually we, I try to do these in person, obviously, but it's, a uh, you're, 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 it's quite a, quite a distance we've got between us, but hopefully, uh, in the future we can make that happen. It's been great talking to you, man. It's been really good to connect. Um, yeah. look forward to continuing to follow your work. It's obviously very important work that you're doing. I mean, this I'm with you, this, site how do you not get hooked on this site and everything that it has to offer and 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 exploring it i mean today it, it is it's it's where things are happening it's where the most where, where the most we're, we're going to learn the most about our ancient past from um these sites that exist within turkey it seems rather obvious at this point so it's a it's a very very big important um, um, deal and, and um, important work that you're doing. So I know that I, I speak for everybody who's listening when we say thank you for doing what you're doing. Keep your mind as open as it is. And, um, you know, we look forward to, to finding out uh, uh, more of what you have to, um, to explore and to teach us about these ancient sites. So thank you. Appreciate it very much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. All right. We'll wrap it up with that.